Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Matthew this morning. We're going to be coming out of Matthew chapter 10. Just a reminder, uh, uh, seven and under, I think they're at Wheat Church right now. That's where they go. And while you're turning there to Matthew chapter 10, uh, I want to make a couple of couple of more announcements. Uh, first of all, just a reminder that at the end of this month, the weekend of July 25th and 26th, that's a Saturday and Sunday, and I've brought this up every time that I preach. Brother Andrew Hutchinson from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is going to be ministering for us that weekend. Uh, if you have any further questions about any of the announcements, just uh, get it. I guess you could ask ask me about it. But the weekend uh, this month, June the 25th and the 26th, uh, we have a special guest speaker. And I'm going to start announcing this now until we get to it, but. Friday, July the 29th, we're going to have a revival night here at Jesus' Lord Family Worship Center. We have a guest speaker, and we have a special group uh, leading praise and worship for us that night. Uh, assembly Worship from Tuckerman Assembly of God. That's Brother Brandon Gates' church. They're going to be leading praise and worship for us that night. And then... Uh, as the Holy Spirit leads us through that service, Brother Paris Reagan from Crossfire Youth Ministry in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is going to be ministering for us that night. So be praying for that and make your plans to be here with us that night. We're going to probably put the announcements out today on social media and uh, just be praying about that. That's Friday, July 29th at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, and I don't think I have anything else to say. So Matthew chapter 10. Uh, gonna, I don't do this regularly when I preach, but I'm only going to be reading a couple of verses today. If you remember, uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I felt the Lord press on my heart that we should take a, a journey through the books of Galatians and Ephesians as he led us to do so and I was planning on continuing that this morning but the Lord had made it a little clear to me that he wanted me to discuss on a specific issue that does in a way relate to the Galatian church but before I get into that there have been a couple of things that I've been personally meditating on throughout the past couple of weeks one of these things that I've been thinking about regularly is uh, victorious Christian living uh, which is possible for Christians who walk by faith. And another thing, and they seem kind of detached from each other, and I haven't really been able to figure out why until recently, but another thing that I've been thinking about uh, just at random is the issue of hell and what exactly it is, why it's so important, um, where people go wrong with teaching and preaching about hell in today's culture. And... Just a couple of days ago, something happened that kind of the Holy Spirit used to bring to my attention that I feel like he wants us to learn about that specific thing this morning. And in Matthew chapter 10, I'm just reading a couple verses right now, verses 27 and 28. At this point, Jesus is basically encouraging his disciples for ministry, what to expect, why to stay in the will of God in spite of everything, all of the opposition that will come against them. And in the middle of his encouragement, he just says this, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. This is Jesus speaking. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And y'all can be seated. I asked the question just a second ago, how exactly would a subject like this relate to uh, the issue going on with the churches at Galatia? And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, when I, when I began to preach through Galatians, 
Paul is writing to a group of believers who have renounced their faith in Jesus Christ in the book of Galatians for another gospel. And to Paul, that would be a very urgent matter because that would mean that the Galatian believers were in danger of falling from grace if they had not fallen from grace already. And it doesn't matter who exactly uh, you are, it doesn't matter who anybody is, whenever you renounce your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are right back to square one, and square one is always nothing short of lost. If you are lost, you are by definition on your way to hell. The only reason why anybody has ever gone to hell is simply because they did not display faith in God. That's the main, that is the prime reason why people go to hell. But before I get ahead of myself, I just want to, uh, because this is a more, comp we have, the church today has been very successful in making the subject of hell a lot more complicated than it needs to be. And this is a subject that has to be approached directly, and it has to be approached with grace. Uh, but before I get into that, let's take a moment and pray. I want to preach to you a message today simply titled, Preach the Truth. So Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, God. We ask that you send the Holy Spirit here to properly teach us from your word, God. This is a sensitive issue that I feel like you've led me to preach about today, God, and I cannot preach about it properly without your help, Lord. I ask that you give us grace in this place today. I ask that you bring the truth and the power of the gospel's message to each of us today, whether we know you personally or not, God. I ask that you anoint my lips to have me speak nothing short of what you have me speak today. Anoint each of us, God, to receive from your word what you have us receive. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is leaving the church at Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, Paul basically says to these people that he has been with for a very long time that he is going back to Jerusalem for the sake of the gospel. And it was a very bittersweet moment for the Ephesian Christians because they had gotten to know Paul as a very sincere friend and as a very sincere brother in the Lord. And the Bible mentions that uh, they wept tears over Paul's departure. It was such a bittersweet moment that some of us could probably relate to whenever a brother or a sister in the Lord goes somewhere else far away. And whenever he is, uh, in essence, giving his goodbyes to them, he basically makes a comment that says that he has no real conviction uh, as it regards the convictions that the Holy Spirit gives about leaving because Paul could be content. He says this, spoken to the Ephesian elders before going back to Jerusalem, For I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Paul, as bittersweet as leaving that church was for everybody, Paul could still at least say that he did not leave any stone left unturned as it regards what he preached to these Ephesians. Paul made sure to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the thing about the truth, especially as it regards what God says, uh, what God deems to be truth, that Truth doesn't always pander to human emotion, but it is necessary because it is nothing short of the truth. Um, you cannot have, you and I cannot have a solid view of God's love until we have some idea of what His wrath is like. And the reason behind this is simply because as we understand what the wrath of God is like and really what life without God is like, that gives us a far better understanding of what his love is like because understanding his wrath gives us a better understanding of what exactly God saved us from. And before I get to that, there are a couple questions mainly about the subject of hell that people ask and a lot of Christians ask, and it's a good question. Um, today in the church, you have two types of people that preach about hell. You either have someone who is almost terrified to bring it up because it might hurt somebody's feelings and therefore they just don't preach about it altogether. And then you have another type of preacher in the church today who 
is so, I, I use the word addicted to preaching the subject of hell because it makes them a better preacher in the eyes of some people. It makes them the anointed man of God because he preaches about hell. And both of these are very seeker-sensitive mentalities. It's just the matter that these two types of preachers are going after different people. I once heard a friend tell me a story one time about how uh, he was at an Easter Sunday morning service and the pastor got up on the pulpit and he said, Today we're going to talk about hell. Y'all thought I was preaching about the resurrection, but not in, the, not in this church. We're talking about hell today. And I, here's why I can tell you why I am sure that that was a totally ineffective message. Because if you are so pride, so pride, so prideful to preach on the subject of hell, you have given really in spirit no leverage for the Holy Spirit to present this subject the way that He desires you to present it. And as far as those types of preachers are concerned, all that matters is that I am the preacher of hell, and therefore I automatically am a man of God, which is false. Nobody who likes the modern church, people who don't like the modern church, which is, I imagine, most of us could probably find issue with the modern church today. But one of the big reasons uh, as to why the modern church is viewed regularly as not a model example for most Christians is because uh, regularly in modern Christian churches, the issue of hell is sidelined very regularly. And while I have zero problem with preaching on hell, during a Sunday morning service, or during a, specifically an Easter Sunday morning service, because then, and it's just the way that culture is here, you know, there are more people going to church during Easter and Christmas than any other time throughout the year, unless some big disaster happens that makes a lot of people scared. Um, and that's the perfect time to preach the gospel. But we are at fault if we preach about a controversial subject or a subject that many have deemed to be controversial for the sole purpose of giving ourselves some kind of glorified celebrity status. That is wrong. And we shouldn't approach these issues like that. If people are lost, they will go to hell for eternity. That's the same place that you and I were going to before we came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So there are a couple questions that come when it comes to preaching about hell. The first question is, why do we preach about hell? What's so special about hell to the point that I have to preach about it? And the first thing that comes to mind with a lot of us is simply because Jesus preached about it. Jesus preached about hell very regularly. You all know from Luke chapter 11 the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and I paraphrase most of this that I'm going to bring up. But in Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives what many have accepted to be a parable and I'll get to that here in a second. The story of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who was, uh, and again I paraphrase, rich and increased with good, the type of person who, uh, as it regards how Jesus talked about it, thought that they really had need of nothing, and then you had the poor, a poor, a poor sick beggar named Lazarus. The, Jesus said that the dogs licked his sores. He was a poor beggar type of person. And he ends this story with the rich man lifting his eyes up from hell after he dies. And when Lazarus, this uh, poor beggar, dies, he's carried up to, as the word of God describes in Abraham's bosom, which is just another phrase for heaven, basically. And the rich man cries out to the angel who's carrying Lazarus up to be with the Lord. He says, send Lazarus down that he may dip, uh, dip his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame and the angel turns back to the rich man and he says that or actually here's what happens uh, the rich man says to the angel that sent to send Lazarus back from the dead to preach to his relatives the angel says your relatives have the prophets they have Moses if they're not listening to them, they will not listen to somebody who's coming back from the dead. And if that is more than a parable, as some people do believe it is, the story of the rich man and Lazarus is the most detailed, the most detailed story that Jesus ever gave during his ministry here on earth. The, more, the majority of the stories that Jesus gave during his ministry... Um, were pretty uh, 
non-specific in detail. A person was a person. They were a man or a woman. And this, you know, the time frame was never given. But here in Luke chapter 11, as it regards the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we have names and we have a specific date and time by letting us know that about Moses. There's nothing else uh, that's that specific in the rest of the parables, the, the rest of the stories that Jesus gives. And for these reasons, many believe that this isn't just a parable that Jesus gave, but it is a true story of a man who actually went to hell. And the rich man says, I am tormented in this flame. And if that rich man is real, and if that rich man went to hell, then that rich man has been in hell from whenever he died up until this very point. And he's never going to have the privilege of escaping. There's Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says that if your right eye offends you to pluck it out because it's better for your one for that one eye to be plucked out than for the whole body to go to hell. Matthew 23 to the scribes and Pharisees, he calls them the he says, Woe to you, the scribes and Pharisees, he calls them serpents, a generation of vipers, and then he asks them, How can you escape from the damnation of hell? There are over 160 references in the New Testament to hell, and 70 of these came from Jesus Christ himself. Nobody preaches about hell as much as Jesus Christ did in the New Testament. Nobody else in the Bible talked about that part of the afterlife more than Jesus himself. I saw a video a while ago. It was of uh, Barack Obama, that, an interview that was taken of him whenever he was in office. And he made a comment about the New Testament, saying, "I will. I would much rather uh, hear what Jesus has to say during uh, the Gospels than what Paul has to say in the Epistles, or something like that." And I assume that this had to do with issues like hell, like issues with the judgment of God. And the fact of the matter is, this: these are issues that you don't really need Paul to talk to you about because Jesus has said a lot more about this specific issue than Paul the Apostle ever did, than anybody else ever did. So that's one thing about hell. Jesus spoke on it himself. And secondly, the reason we talk about hell is so that people know what exactly they're being saved from. It's a statement that we use a lot in the church today. I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. And that is, uh, it is a perfect word to use for what God has done for you in your life. Because God has saved you, but what exactly has God saved you from? God has saved people from two things. He saved them from the dominion of sin, and He has saved them from the wages of sin. He has saved you from the dominion of sin. Sin is no longer your master in Christ, but Christ Himself is your master now that you have been saved. And He saves people from the wages of sin. And we all know that the wages of sin is... The wages of sin is death. Okay, thank you. The wages of sin is death. But as Paul writes in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's a good thing because for people like you and I, hell is only an option. It's not our it's not a certain destination. God has not predestined anybody into hell. For you and I, hell is literally one of two options. We don't have to go to hell whenever we die. It's not a place that we are in any way obligated to spend eternity because of the grace of God. So one question, why do we preach about hell? We preach about hell because Jesus preached about it. And we preach about hell because it tells us what exactly we're being saved from. We're saved from the dominion of sin and we're saved from the wages of sin because of what Jesus Christ has done. And that leads us to another question that a lot of people have to address when talking about hell. And that's exactly what is hell. Jesus Christ makes out very regularly hell to be a literal place. It's not just another word for a generic uh, gravesite. Hell is a very specific place where people who are awake, people who have their senses, people who know what's going on. Hell is a place where things happen. Jesus talks about hell as a very real place. It's not just a poetic uh, 
gesture talking about whenever you die and your body is buried in a grave or for them a tomb, hell is a real place where people do go. And as it regards where exactly hell is, it's something that's been debated. Some people say that hell is in the center of the earth. Some people don't, I don't know. I don't know really what to tell you. I can't tell you for sure where exactly hell is. I just know that hell is real because God says very clearly that hell is real. And twice in the Gospels, in Luke chapter 13 and in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus describes hell as a place of weeping. He describes hell as a place of gnashing of teeth. And what exactly does that mean? There are two types of attitudes presented there regarding people who go to hell. There is the person who goes to hell and they weep in sorrow for eternity because they know exactly now that this is what they deserve and they know beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is nothing that they can do now to escape hell. And they spend all of eternity in great sorrow. And then he says that it is a place of gnashing of teeth. And I've always really wondered what the, exactly that means. I thought it, would, it just meant it talked about the great pain that happens whenever somebody goes to hell, but there's something more specific to that. Gnashing of teeth is something that people do whenever they're angry. And there are two types of people that go to hell. There is the one who is in sorrow for all of eternity, and then there is the one who goes to the same place that that first person goes to, but cannot let their pride go for a moment. And basically the mentality of it all is simply, how dare God send me to a place like this? I deserve better. In the exact same place that the weeper is in, and clearly not consecrated enough to acknowledge that they are where they deserve to be. The type of person who deceives themselves for eternity. Satan is no doubt one of these people. Satan does not believe that he has deserved anything that God has given him as it regards judgment. Satan, whose fate is more final than anybody else's you'll ever meet, is so prideful, so arrogant, does not have a humble bone in his body, really thinks that he deserves to be the God of this world. Satan thinks that he deserves to have dominion over this world. And although the Bible calls him the God of this world, that doesn't mean that he has earned any of it. Satan has rebelled against God, and God, in a type of slow judgment for this world, has given Satan dominion over it. Satan is God's tool, but as far as Satan knows, he doesn't deserve any of this. And many people don't either who go to hell. There is the person who leaps for eternity, and then there is the person who is angry for eternity. But the suffering is just as major for both types of people. Nobody who dies without Jesus Christ can escape eternity in hell. Hell is a literal place, and although we don't know where exactly it is, it is for sure a literal place. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that hell is a place of suffering. We know that hell is eternal. We know that hell is a place that does not give anybody the luxury of death. And there are many people that we know here on earth who would probably consider death in and of itself to be a luxury because of how hard, how awful, how much suffering they go through in their lives. Billy Graham, uh, during his time here on earth, made a controversial statement about hell, about specifically whether or not the flames of hell are literal, whether, there, whether or not there are literal flames in hell. And he made this statement. He said that apparently he did not believe that, that the flames of hell are literal, but rather whenever flames are talked about in, in hell, it's more of some kind of figurative speech talking about the suffering of hell. He didn't believe that hell is, a, is literally a place of literal fire and literal brimstone, but here's what he had to say about hell. He said that he knew that hell was a place of torment. He knew that hell was a lonely place, that it was a depressing place, and it was a place where uh, nobody could ever escape from. And the reason why I bring that up is because if there are no literal flames in hell, which, you know, we believe here that the, those flames are very literal, uh, uh, Jesus would say about hell, you know, he would describe an everlasting fire in Matthew 25. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus talks about 
the place where the worm never dies and that the fire is never quenched. The flames of hell, as far as I know, are very literal. And when Jesus describes it as a place, though, where the worm never dies, that's an interesting statement to make. You think about a worm and how fragile it is. How in the middle of summer, a regular worm cannot wiggle its way across a road without dying, without dehydrating, without perishing. Worms are so sensitive and it is so hard for a worm to stay alive under any hot climate that it's a miracle if a worm can make it to the side of the other side of a road in its own strength. And yet it can die so easily. And yet hell is the type of place where even the most frail of people or even the most weak of people are not given the luxury of death. And let's say that the flames of hell are not literal. Let's say that there is no literal flame in hell. Hell is still the type of place where death would be a luxury even if there is no actual fire there. How many people do we talk about who contemplate suicide? These types of people who think about killing themselves, they see death as a true escape from their situation. To them, death is a genuine luxury. They would rather die, they would rather take their own life than suffer further in this world. And even people who are not committing suicide. How many sick people have you talked to who are so sick physically that they cannot take it anymore and they just wish that the doctor would pull the plug on them because the suffering here on earth is just too great. To so many people on this earth right now, death is a high quality luxury to them. They want to die because to them death is better than suffering. Death is not a luxury that God has given anybody who goes to hell. The suffering that people go through, people have been so lonely here on this earth that they have taken their own life because they really believe nobody cares about them, that nobody is there for them. They don't have the luxury of death, whether they take their own life or not. They don't have that luxury in hell. They are stuck in this eternal fire. They are stuck in this eternal flame. They are stuck in this eternal loneliness forever. And there is no death in hell. Hell is a real place of torment. And we think about that. What exactly is hell? And it's interesting because Jesus talks more about hell than anyone else. You and I probably know more about hell than we do about heaven itself because of the ministry of Christ. Christ is more, a lot more specific about this place than so many other people in the Bible. When you think about it, regardless of, a, of however you view hell, of however you perceive it to be, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that hell is a real place. But more specifically, hell is life without God totally realized. You see it on the news all the time. Whenever catastrophe happens, whenever there is some kind of uproar, whenever there is some kind of riot going on in a big city, whenever people are burning buildings down, whenever somebody has been sick, whenever somebody is dealing with major depression and they want to kill themselves, what's a type of statement that you always hear from people like this? And I hope that you can pardon the, the terminology, but people are always saying throughout these situations, that this is hell on earth. People are always saying during the midst of suffering, I am going through hell. And the idea of it is, is that whenever there is any type of season of godlessness in anybody's life, in any country, the place hell, the place of hell, is always used to describe in some way, shape, or form these awful circumstances and these awful times in life. People always use hell to describe suffering. And that's because whenever we go through bad times, whenever we go through awful times, times that it seems like God is nowhere to be around, we are so acquainted with the place of hell in those dark times. Hell is life without God, in essence. Hell is eternity without God. Many skeptics, famous atheist Richard Dawkins, talks about how he longs for a day where nobody believes in God, where nobody goes to God for their problems. And the fact of the matter is, there is a place where God basically doesn't exist. 
There is a place without God. There is a life that you can live without God. And if you die without your faith in Jesus Christ, you will find yourself in that place for all of eternity. And you will learn very quickly that this is not the place that you thought it was meant to be. Because not only is hell, not only is hell life without God totally realized, it is the uncensored wrath of God totally realized. And why does hell exist? Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25, that hell was prepared for Satan. Satan is a very interesting uh, discussion to talk about Satan himself. We most I, I think that we all know that the devil was once an angel. It's well known at this point. The Bible talks about it. That Satan was once an angel in, uh, in heaven known as Lucifer. And Lucifer, whoever, what, whatever exactly he did, a lot of things that people talk about him I feel are more so lost in theory than anything else. But what we do know about Lucifer is that he was a very impressive angel. He was an angel held in very high regard. We know that he had something to do with music in heaven. We know that Lucifer was an amazing angel. But we also know this, that for some reason, in a time that as far as you and I know, sin did not even exist, Lucifer became so proud of himself to the point that he thought that he was greater than God. And that type of individual cannot exist in the kingdom of heaven because God is greater than everybody else. But pride literally convinces whoever is being proud that they have a chance to be greater than than God himself, and that's just not how it works. So Lucifer was removed from the kingdom of heaven, and apparently his influence was so massive among the angelic hosts that he had managed to convince an entire third of the angelic population to follow behind him in whatever he did. So Satan, uh, along with a third of the angels, were cast out of heaven. And God had prepared this place called hell for these people specifically. Hell was a place prepared for these fallen angels. And yet mankind after his fall would receive that same fate as the fallen angels would. Something that we need to talk about is that Satan is not in hell right now. As I mentioned earlier, Satan has been granted authority over the earth. The Bible describes Satan as the god of this world. Whether people in the world realize it or not, Jesus would call Jesus. Jesus would say to the Pharisees, he would say that their father was the devil. Now, the Pharisees, a, a religious group like that, they would never, they would never ever say themselves that they follow the devil. But Christ made that observation. He labeled them as children of the devil because of how they were spiritually. The Pharisees were of this world. They were under the influence of this world. The satanic influence that dominates this world system, the Pharisees were all in that. They thought that they were the perfect religious group. They thought that they were serving God flawlessly, but they were just as lost as anyone else who did not follow God. The Pharisees were a lost people, and anyone who is lost, whether they realize it or not, are under the influence of Satan. That doesn't mean that every lost person is demon-possessed, but in some way, shape, or form, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, if anybody follows these two main little sinful philosophies, they, by definition, according to Christ himself, are children of the devil. You can either be a child of the devil and spend eternity in hell, or you can be a child of God and spend eternity in heaven. These two types of people, the contrast is made so clear by God throughout the scriptures. There is no one who can play middle ground in this issue. There's no one who can straddle the fence. That individual has never, ever existed. You are either lost or you are saved. You are either wheat or you are chaff. You either know God or you don't know God. And those who do not know God will spend eternity in hell. Satan's destination is final, though. Satan doesn't have the privilege that you and I have. 
It is a greater privilege, you got to get this, to be a redeemed man, a redeemed woman, than it is to be an angel in heaven. Y'all go ahead and turn with me to Psalm, this is the 96th Psalm, real quick. I want us to read something. Psalm 96. Psalm 96. I'm going to start at verse 1 real quick. Psalm 96, it says, Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord has made the heavens. That new song that it talks about is a song that only a redeemed people can sing. We hear that phrase regularly, I have a new song that even the angels cannot sing. That's the truth. The angels don't know what it's like to be redeemed. They, they've never been given that privilege. They don't know what it's like to be saved. They don't know what it's like to have your sins washed away. Whether they are fallen or whether they are angels in heaven right now. They don't know what it's like to be you and I. They don't have a testimony of salvation. And because of that, God considers you and I a higher class than the angels themselves. Because unlike the angels, you and I have been tempted with sin. We have lived in sin. And now our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the thing about that. Nobody exactly has to go to hell. Nobody has to go to hell. No human being has got to go to hell. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we read this. <clears throat> we read that in, Jesus says this, and it's a very famous teaching. He says, enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus Christ is, in essence, a serious realist right now. He's not saying that there are few who find this straight and narrow gate just for the sake of making people feel guilty about themselves. But he's simply saying, this is how it is. The pleasures of this earthly life are so strong over the human mind and the human heart that there are many who go in at the broad path, and many who go in at that wide path, and there are many who find destruction at the end of it because they would honestly prefer this world over life with God. They want life to be without God, and in turn they get eternity without God. But those who enter in at that straight gate, those who enter in at this narrow gate, have eternity with God. Those who want to live with God are blessed by being able to spend eternity with God. Why does Jesus call it a straight and narrow gate? And it's because unlike the wide path, the straight and narrow gate mainly has to do with the fact that it is a gate, it is a path that is rarely ever accepted. It's a path that is rarely ever found because most people don't want to find this gate. Most people don't want to walk this path, and for that reason, they don't find it because most people don't look for it to begin with. Whenever the idea of being saved is brought to anybody in this world, most people that you witness to, and most of you already know this, most people that you witness to reject the gospel and accept it whenever you present it to them. It's not a popular path. It's not a popular gate. But it is the gate, it is the path that leads to not just life, but life more abundantly. Life of Jesus is life more abundantly. The subject of hell has to be grace-minded. Uh, you cannot do this thing that a lot of preachers do where we're going to talk about hell for 15 minutes and then that's the end of the service. That's pure evil, actually. Because what you do, in essence, in that moment is tell somebody that hell exists, but Christ doesn't, which is wrong. That is a wrong mentality to have about hell. We preach about hell because it exists. It is a real place. This, is, this place is 100% real. But we can't use the subject of hell 
just for the sake of making people feel guilty about themselves. Conviction is not your responsibility. Conviction isn't my responsibility. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And if someone is going to accept the gospel, it is because the Holy Spirit has made them has made it real to them. Not because you and I have preached the gospel to somebody, but because the Holy Spirit through you, through me, has made the gospel real to these people. God does that. And you and I have to be his vessels. D.L. Moody said this, No one should ever preach on hell without a tear in his eye. And the idea there is nobody should ever preach about hell without a sensitivity about it, without a, this grieving mentality when they teach about hell. Because the fact is more people will go to hell than there will be people who go to heaven. And in our lack of understanding about what hell really is, because we've never been there, and by the grace of God, by grace through faith, we will never be there. We can't say from experience or anything that hell is a bad place. This is something that we have to stick to because God tells us to stick to it, that hell is very real. In Matthew chapter 19, this is a very famous story, very famous statement. That's the chapter where the rich young ruler approaches Jesus Christ. And this rich man says to Jesus that he has been so faithful in keeping the law that he has kept the whole law of God. Jesus says to the rich young ruler, okay, give away all of your possessions and then follow me. And then this rich young man leaves disappointed because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to give away everything. He doesn't want to give away his riches for the sake of following after Jesus Christ. We have this idea, and Sister Jan Bailey uh, in her teaching this morning mentioned it in passing that you know, many people have this idea that money itself is the root of all evil. And, you know, we know that that's not the case. And I don't know what our idea is. I don't know what the idea is here in this country of blaming our problems on inanimate objects. But the fact is that money has never done anything for you. What you've done with money is one other thing. And that's why the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And many have accepted this idea that Jesus had an agenda to just send all of the rich people to hell and take all of the poor people to heaven, and it's not that simple either. The reason why Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus specifically when talking about hell in that story is because at this time it was a major heretical thought that the Pharisees had introduced to the regular Jewish man and woman that if you were rich, that automatically meant that you were all right with God, and that automatically meant that you were blessed by God, and that if you were poor, much less a beggar, then that was God's curse on your life. And Jesus, in telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus, basically flipped that ideology right side up, really, saying that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter who you are economically, but with the great possession of money, this is just how the Bible presents it to us, with a great possession of money comes great temptation to love money over God. It doesn't mean that every rich person is lost. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, a man who buried Jesus in the tomb. He was a rich man. Job would have been probably, by that, that by the economy of his time, just probably would have been one of, if not the richest person in the known world of his time. But we cannot say that we are right with God because of our financial status. That's heresy. That is deceiving ourselves. And Jesus says that after the rich young ruler leaves him in disappointment, he turns to his disciples and he says, You know, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. And the disciples haven't heard this. They were shocked. I mean, especially after all of their lives their idea of rich people coming from the, that teaching of the Pharisees. But, I mean, they were so stunned by that statement. They said to him, Lord, if, it, if that's not possible, then how can anybody enter in into the kingdom of heaven? And that's where Jesus says it. Uh, one of the most iconic quotes in the Bible. The disciples have asked him, Lord, if a rich man can get into heaven, how can anybody get into the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus tells them, he says, let me tell you this, with man this is impossible. With man, by man's efforts, by man's doctrine, by man's teaching, by man's efforts, not a single person can enter into the kingdom of heaven, whether they're rich or poor, and it's not possible. And then he says this, he says, but with God, 
all things are possible. So whether you're rich or you're poor, anybody can enter into the kingdom of heaven, Be not because of who that man or that woman is, but because of who God is. God can do anything. Of course God can bring a soul into heaven for all of eternity. Of course God can do that. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And that's, so, that's, one of, that's probably the most wonderful thing about the gospel, is that it's all about God. It gears your attention totally to the person of Jesus Christ himself. It doesn't demand, it doesn't ask at all that you depend on yourself about what you can do, your own efforts. It asks that you be dependent on the efforts of God himself, because that's the only hope that you and I have as it regards where we're going to spend eternity. Hell is real, 100%. It is a real place, but nobody has to go there. Nobody who has a soul has to spend eternity in hell. As I mentioned earlier, it is just an option. The other option, whereas hell is life without God, fully realized, heaven is life with God, fully realized, mainly because God is actually there. God is in heaven, and the streets of gold, the mansions... All of it is a reflection of walking with God. Nobody ever went to heaven because they want to go wherever a street of gold is. Nobody ever went to heaven because they want to live in a mansion forever. Everybody who's in heaven right now is in heaven because they lived by faith in the Son of God. And if that's good enough for the disciples, if that's good enough for the Apostle Paul, that's good enough for you and me. Amen? So yeah, hell is a real place. But there is a grace that we have to approach this subject with. Hell is a real place. Hell is just as real as God himself. It is a place of torment. It is a place of, well, I, well, I'll, I'll teach you at least, that it is a place where the flames are literal. It is a place of eternal torment where nobody escapes. But heaven is just the exact opposite. Heaven is where God is. And I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, Paul writing to the church at Philippi. He would say to them, he would say, you know what? I have not been perfected, and I have not attained, but I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, that, that mark, that goal, is Jesus himself. Jesus Christ is my end goal. And in heaven, I will have been perfected. I will have attained because in heaven I will have totally reached that goal. I will be with Christ forever. That is my reward. And our blessed hope is whenever Jesus Christ actually returns. Our hope, our goal, our reward, all of it is found in the person and in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has built a bridge between God and man, where man was certain to separate himself from God for the longest time. Jesus Christ built that bridge at Calvary's cross. And the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, would make it very clear that if you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, no, no, he would say, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Acts, whenever the jailer was about to commit suicide after that great earthquake had shaken the prison, Paul called out to him, and the jailer asks Paul, what must I do to be saved? The jailer knew that that earthquake was an act of God, and the jailer knew that this was the God that he was going to be in relationship with, and Paul said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved in his house. Salvation is very simple. Salvation is wonderful. Salvation has guaranteed you and I to not be on our way to hell. The ministry of a Christian, because, you know, it's true, not every Christian is called to preach. But every Christian is used for God to preach through them. Your life, your testimony, what you tell other people, not everyone is called to be an evangelist. But every Christian should evangelize, you know what I mean? Amen. Every Christian should be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because God has rescued you from hell. God has rescued you from eternal judgment. And in doing so, eternal judgment has been exchanged for eternal glory. So what do we get about, what, what exactly do we get about knowing about the existence of hell as Christians if we're not going there? Well, first of all, it humbles us greatly. 
to know that God has rescued us from this awful place. And secondly, of course, it gives us a great motivation to go out and share our faith with this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, won't y'all pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this great day that you've given us, Lord. And we ask that you use us, Lord, throughout our week to witness to this lost and dying world, God. Even if it's people that we know nothing about, God, use us to share the goodness of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross for us, Lord. Use us as the light of this world. Use us as the salt of this earth, Lord God. Whenever we learn about hell, we are reminded of your grace towards us, God, and that while we were yet sinners, you sent your only begotten Son down to die for us anyways. We cannot thank you enough for what you have done, Lord. We bless your name in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.